Hey guys, you know, when it comes to NCAA, uh, college choice, athletic, and so forth, uh, some of my colleagues in the county have already had him speak, um, and great, great reviews. He actually, the reason we have that at 8 o'clock night is he just came from Bay Shore, he did a presentation there, uh, and then he's got two tomorrow, uh, tomorrow we're in Westchester, and another one, you know, he's, he actually flew from LA this morning. So uh, it's uh, going to be a great experience for you, we be very knowledgeable uh, for a lot of information. Well, I appreciate it, and um, just a couple of quick housekeeping things, okay? Uh, before I even go into myself, before I even go into the appreciation to the Mr. T's and the principals and the superintendents and the individuals that really were responsible for bringing me in, I am high energy, I will move quick, this will be class participatory, not just the student athletes, but the parents. This presentation is truly for you, the reason they asked me to come in and do this is because of the education that I believe I provide, which is the real life, real world spin of what's going on. Now, I, like I said, I'm a little different. So here's the first thing. That is not for me. It's not even for the people I just mentioned. It's literally for you. And the reason it's literally for you is for this reason and this reason only. How many students go to this school? Because the people who aren't here, they've got it covered. They're going to get a Division I scholarship. They don't need to learn anything because they it doesn't apply to them. We all know that parent. And here's another thing. For the students, I appreciate you being here. I'll go through what your responsibilities are in literally less than two minutes. This presentation is for mom and dad. So for all those parents out there, when every single time I go to a presentation and see parents picking up their kids and driving away knowing that this is going on, and if I were to knock on that window and say, does your son or daughter want to play in college? I'm going to go with the percentages that they are going to say yes. They're not here, you are. So I personally appreciate it, but you have proven to me, you have proven to this school that you don't know it all. You might get something out of tonight, you might think that I was a waste of time, but you showed up. So, yeah, I spoke at Bay Shore at 6, and I'll speak at two Section 1 schools tomorrow, another one on Wednesday, and then back out here on the island on Thursday before I fly to Nebraska to go see one of my guys on Oakland and hang out with him for a few days and go to the Nebraska-Indiana game, and then fly to Nashville and go see a couple of the players on the Reds, because I represent Yasiel Puig and Hunter Pence and all-star Major League Save leader Kirby Yates. Yankee one time, by the way. Um, those Yankee fans, Jordan Montgomery, Kyle Higashioka, one of your top pitching prospects, Nick Nelson, I represent all of them. I'm from Yorktown. I'm like you. There's not a huge difference between Section 11 and Section 8 and Section 1 and Section 9 in Bergen County and Fairfield County. It's all the same community, so to speak, from a high school athletics perspective. Okay, I come here because I know what this process means to these young men and these young women. I furthermore know the lack of education that's out there for the parents who truly in their heart of hearts want to do what's best for their son or their daughter. So that's a little housekeeping. I'm going to start, and there's only a handful of students, and that's okay. So that means you're just going to be more involved. I'm going to start by asking all those students to raise their hands so I know where you are, because inevitably I'm not going to have to go back and forth. Give me a real honest old pie. Where are you? I know you're saying we're not going to raise the pie. So where are you? Okay, so you all have a question to answer. It's option A, option B. It's going to be a theme tonight. Option A, I'm a college coach, and I tell any one of you, whatever sport you play, you have made our college team. There's no scholarship money. But you have made our college team. You're never going to see the field as a freshman, never see the court as a sophomore, going to get some sparing garbage playing time as a junior. We'll give you a token start here or there as a senior. But that is your college athletic playing opportunity. Here's your uniform. There's the end of our bench. It's option A. Option B, college coach says, we expect you to come in and compete as a freshman. 
We think you'll start as a sophomore. By the time you're a junior, you're a great grower in the lineup. By the time you get out of here as a senior, you're an all-time record holder. Maybe you're the captain. Perhaps you've been to a couple of postseasons, really had an unbelievable four-year on-field playing experience. That's option B. For all the students that just raised their hand, how many of you are taking option A? How many are taking option B? It's unanimous. Every single one of these student athletes just told me they want to play Division II and Division III. Because that's what that opportunity sounds and looks like. And so I now have a question for mom and dad. Who wants to play Division I? Them or you? I've been here less than 10 minutes. They all told me they want to play D2, D3. Who wants to play Division I? Sadly, in my opinion, it is mom and dad. And that's why we have an issue. That is why people like myself get up at 4 in the morning to be on a 5.30 flight to fly across the country and drive two hours from New York to be here for 75 minutes. And I have far more of a passion doing something like this than a lot of other aspects of my job as a Major League Baseball agent. So, now that I know that these student athletes want to play Division II and Division III, let me run you through some statistics. And I told you, a lot of this is my opinion. This is my 20 plus years of being in pro sports, a little bit in college athletics, but let me run you through a couple of stats, because you know what, stats are a lot. These are facts. This is the percentage of high school athletes who are in a spot on a men's or women's Division I team. Listen for your sport. Less than 3% for football, water polo, field hockey, lacrosse, golf, swimming, track, soccer, and cross country. Less than 2% for baseball, softball, and tennis, and less than 1% of the high school athletes who will play on a Division I men's or women's team is basketball, wrestling, and volleyball. Any ice hockey players here? Too bad, you have the highest percentage of 5%. So, um, as you can tell, those are pretty daunting stats. That was just to make the team. That was option A. I didn't say at any point during those stats anything about scholarship. To get a Division I athletic scholarship, those stats are half of those percentages. A half a percent to 1.5% of the athletic playing population is going to be a Division I scholarship athlete. And the way the economics work now, that is going to be a partial scholarship. I represent Jordan Montgomery, major league pitcher for the New York Yankees, from South Carolina, went to South Carolina, was a Division I national champion in baseball, was a fourth round pick, and now is a big leaguer, and he got a third of the scholarship. Anyone that tells you they got a full athletic scholarship, they are not being truthful. I'm from Yorktown. I was a baseball player in the land of lacrosse. I know where I am. I get Long Island. I get lacrosse is king. Boys, girls, men's, women's. It's a different world. Syracuse, Hopkins. I know even out west. Schools like Arizona State, D1 now. Denver, powerhouse. Still, for the Division I player who is lucky enough to get a Division I athletic scholarship regardless of sport, there is a huge difference choosing the University of Maryland with 35,000 students and Marist with 3,500. They're both Division I opportunities. Marist, St. Francis of Pennsylvania, Ryder, Robert Morris. I'm willing to bet some of you have never even heard of those schools. They are D1s, no different than Texas and Southern Cal and Oregon. One and a half percent is the high. This would be the most sobering statistic I give you all night. Of all of these sports that I just mentioned, I'm going to use baseball as the example. Why? Because baseball gives you the highest probability of success. There are 130,000 high school seniors playing baseball coast to coast. 130,000. 9,800 of those will go on to play at a four-year Division I, Division II, Division III, and NAIA school. NAIA is like Division II or III, for the most part set in the Midwest and out west, but it's a collegiate classification. That is D1, D2, D3, NAIA combined. 
9,800 of the 130,000 will move on to be a freshman at a four-year school. That's 7.5% of the population. Baseball has the highest percentage of success of all those sports I said. Better said, 92.5% of all the high school seniors playing baseball will not play at any college four-year level less than a year from now. The next time we think that D3 is beneath us, we scoff at the notion of D2. You might want to think again, because for every one of these student athletes, the most remarkable athletic accomplishment they will have to date is to be the worst Division III player on the worst Division III team in the United States. Now, I am not here to burst bubbles. I am not here to create this world that a Division I scholarship is not possible. I promise you, I will end this presentation with a choice, with a possibility that could easily happen to a student athlete here on this campus. But because I myself, a four-year non-scholarship Division II baseball player at Stonehill College outside of Boston, I am part of the 97 to 99% of the population that is better qualified to play and compete at the D2 and D3 level. You know the same level that all of these student athletes just told me that they want to play. So now that we have a general understanding as to where the stats are and the stats go lie, none of that has been my opinion to this point. I think we have at least a bit of an understanding and a game plan as to what we need to be prepared for and how daunting of a task this is going to be. And when I tell you that money is always a factor, money is not going to be your enemy in this process. What is going to be your biggest enemy is time. And so taking the time, the execution, the research, the plan to choose where and how you spend those resources up against the clock, that's what's going to matter the most. Because this process is not your athletic director's job, it's not your summer ball coach's job, it's not your guidance counselor's job, it's not your principal's job, and mom and dad, it's not just your son or daughter's job. It is the role of the family to do this. Because, and I'll prove this quickly, I am confident that if I said to every adult in this room, let's go out and buy a $100,000 vehicle, I don't care if it's a Range Rover or a Mercedes, uh, a Lexus, a Beamer, whatever. You didn't care which actual car brand. You just were going to go and invest in this nice luxury car. You would likely go through that car buying process at painstaking nausea, wearing out sales rep after sales rep. I don't like the way the backseat interior looks on cloudy days when I'm stuck in traffic on the LIE. This car is out. That's a hundred thousand dollar purchase. You'll take the time and the research and the effort and the resources to look into that. But to the first Division three non-scholarship coach up in Buffalo who saw your son or daughter for 90 minutes at a showcase and tells you that they could be their starting goalie as a sophomore at the tune of 150 to 200 to 250 thousand dollars over four years. That's how you're going to make your college decision-making decision? Where are the priorities? And, and, and to me, that's our mom and dad. So tonight, our goal as a group, collectively, is to find a game plan to pre-qualify ourselves to be recruited. And it's going to take a little bit of time to get there. I guarantee you there's already people in this room who are either A, annoyed, B, Surprised, this isn't one I thought I was going to hear. And C, wondering how soon and why and how we are going to get to that process. I promise you, it will all be covered tonight. So let's go class participation. Show me the students' hands again. Right here in the middle. You got a handout? Grace Wetcher? Yeah. Read for me what one says. Right student body size. Right student body size. So what year are you? What grade are you? What is it? 10th grade. 10th grade. What do you think right student body size is? No wrong answer. <laughs> Take a guess. Student body size. What do you think that means? 
Think of, uh, think of like this room. It has nothing to do with you personally, right? Student body size, right? We said there are 500 and some odd students to go here. What do you think it means? Give it another shot. Um, the size of the class. Yeah, how big of a class? Big class, small class, big school, small school, right? What is the right student body size for me? Because what might be right for her might be different for her, might be different for him. So I'll give you an example. And this is another thing that I think every parent needs to understand when having conversations with their son and their daughters. I eat at Applebee's in Johnson City, Tennessee with 18-year-old kids who got drafted in June. That conversation is excruciating. It is hard to communicate with these kids if they're able to put their phone down. I understand how challenging extracting information, mom and dad, is from your son or your daughter. I deal with it as an agent of some of these players. This process is designed to also create a bit of a dialogue to hopefully get some real honest, real contextual ability to answer these questions in a pilot. So, I'll give you an example. What's your first name? Katie. Katie? Okay, Katie. I know this is a little advanced for you because you're only a sophomore, right? But here's a real life real world example. Class is now like 43 minutes long. You can probably text your way through. You can take a nap during algebra, but not in college. Why? <clears throat> because I'm the professor, and I'm up here on the whiteboard, and the lecture hall is three times the size of this auditorium. There are 200 people in this class. And this class isn't 43 minutes, it's 70 minutes. And you're not going to take it once a week, you're going to take it three times in one day, three times a week. That's what your learning environment is going to look like for all of those students out there. It's going to be nothing like high school. So I'm a professor speaking faster than I'm speaking now, with 199 other students in it. And you've got a question in the back, 75 rows away, and I'm just very good through this. I'm, I'm going to ignore it. And if I do say, yeah, you got a question back there, what can't you keep up with? You better be ready for 199 faces to turn around and look at you. That question better be on point. That's a real college lecture hall learning environment. Let's call that learning environment A. Or learning environment B. Let's take half this room, split it right down the middle, and every seat is taken. 40, 45 students in the class. You have a question to that? That's a good point, Emily. What do you think about that, John? Oh, John, that's, I never really thought about that, man. You want to weigh in on that? Okay, that is a different learning environment. Same seven in the class, don't get me wrong. But the 30, 40, 50 students versus the 200 students, this is option B. For all of those students, you have to choose A or B. Who wants option A? Who wants option B? Once again, unanimous. Every one of these student athletes told me they want a smaller learning environment. How many times do we hear the proverbial, well, I don't really care about the college as long as it's a good school, they get a good education. Well, if these students just told me that they are more comfortable accelerating in the classroom to get that education in an environment like this, then why are we putting them in a class with 200 strangers where they cannot keep up? This is where mom and dad have to be more aware and have questions and answers with their children. I don't care if it's driving home from the game and instead of asking, what happened when you drove and that ball got up by you? You know what happened. What happened when you left that runner on in second? We were at the game. How about asking questions like this? Because it's going to move like that. So we're going to call it a college with less than 7,000 students. It could be the Stone Hills where I went with 2,300. It could be a bigger school with 6,800. They're both going to have this type of setup. That's what they asked for. That's what they want. Let's give them what they want. And by the way, every one of these student athletes are going to be on a full scholarship. Any idea who's going to provide that full scholarship? Mom and dad. Again, at the tune of $150,000 to $200,000 to $250,000 over four years. So if you were going to buy that car, you'd dig in on that. You need to be digging in on something as simple as 30, 40, 50 students is their comfortable classes. Good job. All right, somebody raise their hand. Let me see the student athletes. I see you there. You're waving your hair. It's a great hair. They call that big league flow. <laughs> so, read for me what number two is. Comfortable proximity from home. Okay, proximity might be on the ACTs or the SATs. What do you think 
think that means? Like how far away it is? How far away, how close? How far or how close from CMHS to my lawn be? Okay? Now, proverbial lady always here as far away from mom and dad as possible. I want out of town. That's okay. I wanted to go to Florida. I told you, I'm from Westchester. I'm from Yorktown. I was convinced I was going to Florida. I just spoke at Bayshore. I had a kid not only wanted to go to Cali, he wanted to go to Santa Barbara. He knew he wanted to go to college in Santa Barbara. I got no problem with that. He's a sophomore. He's got two and a half years left in this process. And what I would say to mom and dad, because I know you're spending thousands of dollars on showcases, on private instructors, and then on lodging, and meals, and gas, and who knows what else, to the tune of $10,000 over four years, hey, buy yourself a Southwest flight. Grab yourself a nonstop jet blue from JFK to LAX for 200 bucks. And take them on that trip. So for that student that does want to go to Florida, Chicago, the Carolinas, Texas, I don't care. Drag them out of bed at 4 a.m. like I did. Get them to the airport. Take them through TSA. They probably don't want to pre-check. That could be 90 minutes alone. Get them to the gate. Put them on that six-hour flight, three-hour flight. That two-hour flight is really a five-hour flight because it's got a layover in Baltimore or Raleigh to get to Baton Rouge. Put them through that process. And then when you get to that location, you don't necessarily have to see the school that they want to see. I don't care what campus you go to, but play the part. Because by the time they get there, you're talking about a 6, 8, 10, 12, 14 hour traveling. The whole day's gone. So you wake up the next day, you do whatever you want to do. You know what you're doing the next day? You're coming back. That's called coming home for the weekend. And you're not going to do that once over four years. You're going to do that six or eight times your freshman year alone. Four to six times your sophomore year. Three to five times your junior year. Yeah, by the time you're a senior, maybe you come home once or twice. Well, I just did the math. You did that commute 20 to 25 times over four years. Not only are you probably not having the same amount of family time, friend time, whatever the reason you're coming home is, you better factor that in as a financial piece. Because, I don't know about you, but going back and forth from LA to New York, LA to Orlando, New York to Chicago, whatever, that's going to cost you a couple of bucks. So, you need to be aware of circumstances like that. How many people know they want to stay in the Northeast? Raise your hand. Good. I wanted to stay in the Northeast. I couldn't stand New York. I was not going to school in upstate New York. I was not coming out to the island. I wasn't going to school in Jersey or Pennsylvania. I was going to go to school somewhere outside of Boston. I at least knew that. But I also knew that was a three or four hour drive. So for those of you who raised your hand, who raised their hand in the Nike sweatshirt, any idea what area you'd want to go? Because from here, let's call it, depending upon if you take the ferry or not, to get up to Boston is going to take three or four hours. To get down to Baltimore, Delaware, out to Scranton, it's going to be three or four hours. Out towards Syracuse, right? Three or four hours. Any idea where you want to go? Like out of college? Yeah, like, but a region. It doesn't have to be exact school. Uh, like, yeah, like north, north, uh, northeast, east. Northeast. Northeast. Yeah. But if I say to you, Boston versus Syracuse versus Philadelphia versus Baltimore versus Washington, D.C., and gave you five very different geographical cities. Is there one that appeals to you? Um, probably, well, they're all, they're all not that They're all in the Northeast, and they're all four and a half hours away. Yeah. But this is real life. What's your name? John. What is it, John? John, yeah. Johnny? John. Young? John. John. Yes. That's what I said the first time. Yeah. <laughs> All right, John. So you're you're a perfect example, okay? Because you want to stay in the Northeast. I gave you five cities that couldn't be any further apart, but also they are very different from the other. Okay? Who you go to school with in Boston with those weird talking New Englanders is going to look and sound a lot different than the people that are, I don't know, in Delaware or outside of D.C., okay? 
That'll be number four. We'll get to that. But the purpose of identifying that we want a school for this example within four hours, under 7,000 student body, within four hours, asking a, what, what year are you? Uh, 2021. So 2020 or 21? 21. So asking a junior to have all of these answers, that, that, that's just unrealistic in, in my opinion, mom and dad, somewhat irresponsible. But to at least create a foundation, we know that our group wants less than seven grand, four hours away from it. Those are two major, major steps in the process. And I'm, I'm in the business of not dashing dreams. I, I'm not here to create this dream and boom scenario. I'm just here to create some education. And so if he wants to go and check out a school in South Carolina, in Myrtle Beach, in Chicago, get on that plane and start to really qualify and quantify what that looks like. So we know what we're looking for. So I'm going to admit to you in advance, this is a curveball question. I'm a college coach and I see you at a showcase in Hartford. I don't care what the sport is. And after the showcase, I come up to you and I say, hey, look, I, I couldn't take my eyes off you. you. You were, without question, the best player on the field. Um, and I truly believe that you could come in and compete for us as a freshman start as a sophomore. I do believe that. You were on a different level. We're not Division I, okay? We're Division II, Division III, it doesn't matter. But we're, we're a Division III program. By a show of hands, adults included, who considers that being recruited? Raise your hand. Just a handful of us? I mean, I definitely think it's being recruited. I think people think that there has to be some sort of athletic scholarship attached to consider it being recruited. No way. You've busted your butt. You probably paid to go to the showcase with the expectation that a coach gives you some attention. That is exactly what happened. That's being recruited. This is great. Coach, sounds good, tell me more. Absolutely. We are uh, located in Buffalo, New York. Okay, Buffalo, I'm doing the math here. That's definitely more than four hours away. Uh, and our student body, we're, uh, uh, we have a master's program too, but our student body undergrad is 12 grand, 12,000 students. Okay, so I'm looking at a school that's seven hours away with 12,000 students, and I've already identified that I want a school that's within four hours with less than 7,000 students. I would really appreciate those people that are honest. How many people would go to that school and check it out if you get recruited? Thank you for the honesty. There you go, okay. Look, in 1992, I probably would have to. But as a group, do we see how I said in advance this is a curveball question? It's too big and it's too far. Forget about the division. We haven't talked about majors and minors or extracurriculars or, quite frankly, athletic level of competition. Because I can tell you that Stonehill, even though it's Division II, would get their butts kicked against Cortland State. Because Cortland State is ranked in the top 25 in basically every single sport they play. They are virtually a Division I program. So don't confuse D2 versus D3. But for the purposes of this recruiting trip, when I told you you're up against time, you are wasting your time going to Buffalo. This is about ego. And in my opinion, there's no way you can hang that on the kid. The kid went out and did their job. They earned the opportunity to get the coach's attention to have that coach say, we'd love to have you come check us out. That's on mom and dad. Now what you can do from an experience like that is, if you are good enough to play at that D3 in Buffalo, you are very likely good enough to play in probably most D3s in that conference, arguably in that region. So how about we try to find schools, maybe even in that conference, that are under 4,000, excuse me, under 7,000 within four hours. They will exist. When I tell you dozens, possibly as many as 100 <coughs> four-year schools out there that fit that criteria, that you just got that confidence boost that you could play at that level, that they're out there, if you don't play me, believe me, you go knock on your guidance counselor's school. Because they're here to help, and you're giving them an opportunity to make their job not so much easier, but more streamlined to assist you. They're out there. That's why that's a curveball question. You're here to talk about recruiting. 
<clears throat> We're going to get to number five, I promise. But if you don't identify number one and number two, and oh, by the way, we're here for the education, we haven't even talked about the majors and the minors. And six people have already on the throughway on their way to Buffalo to school that's too big. This is a good time to interject. I said that the students have a responsibility. Every single student athlete has three jobs. This is why they could have checked out a long time. The first is to bust their butt on the field. Practice field, game field, off-season, conditioning, working out, whatever. To make them the best athletes they can be. They control them. Same exact discipline, same exact effort in the classroom. Best students they can be. During the tests, the prep, the homework, extra credit, extra help, ACT, SAT. Tutors, whatever. Be the best academic individual you can be. And then the part of the equation that, in my opinion, gets missed the most, put down the Fortnite, put down the FIFA, and get involved in the community. Go volunteer. Go be a human being. Get yourself out into society and contribute. Why? Because more than ever, character matters. I don't care if it's volunteering with special needs, if it's you love animals, so you're going to go help out the local ASPCA, inner city that don't have the resources and, quite frankly, the privileges that maybe a community like this has and needs volunteers to umpire games, run the clock, whatever. You got to get out there and do it. That is the responsibility. Those three simple responsibilities are on the student. Everything else is online. So let's talk about number three. Uh, where's it? Right here. Great for number three things. What do you think that means? Desire fields of study. What year are you? It's another junior. Let's make you guys a little bit of year. Where's you say that? I'm a junior. I'm in level three. Um, 2021. So this is going to get real very quick, right? So, my question to you is, any idea what you want to major? Education. Education. So at least you know, and I think that's great. Okay? Uh, I will say that while you want to work in education, anything in particular right now, keeping in mind that you're a junior in high school, anything in particular? Yeah. Math teacher. Perfect. So, math teacher. Very noble. There's a career path to it. Let me ask you this. What is your favorite subject? And what subject do you get your best grades in? Okay, that's a good start to be a math teacher. What's your second favorite subject? Science. Science. Math and science usually go together. And what is the subject, second best subject that you do well? Science. Okay, so I think we're picking up a theme here. She's math science, not English social studies. I get, just using make sure as an example, you know, I, I want to go into medicine, I want to be a doctor. I think that's awesome. That student, you're going to need bio, you're going to need chem, you're going to need biochem, you're going to need applied sciences, right? Those four-year schools that we're talking about, you know, the ones that have 7,000 students within four hours, they're going to have mathematics. They're going to have sciences like bio and chem and biochem and the things that she might be interested in. It's not so specific where I want to be a marine biologist, so let's drop everything we're doing and go to SUNY Maritime. We are giving ourselves an opportunity to call an audible because when they get on campus and they realize that that 70 minute class, even though that the school and the class size is smaller, is way more advanced than they expected, and they come home on Thanksgiving, and between past and mashed potatoes, they slip in, I want to change my major, and that can happen. If you're at school because you put all your eggs in that, we're going to go to this school because it's the best in the region for it, you might want to be ready to make an adjustment. She wants to be a math teacher. I hope that's great. And when she's in those math classes, they're going to make her take economics classes. And they'll probably make her take accounting classes. And they might even make her take business.
business classes. And then all of a sudden, she wants to go be an accountant. She wants to go be, I don't know, a, a business development person. She's got a ton of range, all for something that is mathematically based. You know, the subject that she does the best in. Just keep that in mind. So for our purposes, 7,004 hours, math is a major. Maybe he has accounting, maybe he has business, maybe he has bio, maybe he has chem. Dozens of schools. I still argue as many as a hundred exist up. But we still haven't talked about it. So let's get to number four. Read for me what four says. What do you think that means? What's extracurriculars here? Clubs, right? Things that you choose to be a part of, right? Right? You're not forced to be a part of that club. You decide, I want to be a part of the student center. I want to be in this. I want to be in that. Extracurriculars. Well, I'm going to give you a very, very different type of extracurricular. This is for all the students. You have to choose between A and B. Here's the good news. Zero parental supervision. Your parents are on around. You're with all your best pals, and guess what? You can do whatever you want. No parents, all the pizza you can eat, all the junk food you can handle, not mom and dad nowhere around and all your best pals. And I'm gonna give you the choice between going skiing and snowboarding and just spending an entire day on the mountain, that at the end you make a fire and you're eating all the food and you're just having jokes and you're having the best time in the world. That's option A, the mountains. Option B is still no parents, still all the pizza and the junk food, still all your best pals. But you'd rather be in a little bit of a warmer weather climate. It's not Miami Beach, but it's like those, those spring days where all of a sudden it's 74, 77. You, know, you want to get outside, you want to go play golf, you want to play beach volleyball on the little sand court that they have in the park. You want to maybe go for a hike. Those kind of warmer spring days. That's option B. All the students have to choose one or the other. How many want to go into the mountains, the skiing and the snowboarding? Raise them high. Just the one, not two, three, okay. And how many want to go into the warmer weather? Great. To me, that's an extra curriculum. Because we have a choice. John, because his name's John, it's not Yon or anything else I see. John said, Boston, Syracuse, Philly, Baltimore, I just want to be in the Northeast. Well, I'll tell you this. The spring in Baltimore, in D.C., in Delaware, that's going to start way sooner than the spring in Syracuse, New York, or Manchester, New Hampshire. The fall and the warmer temperatures, like we've been having here, is going to last way longer than it will in Manchester and in Syracuse. If we can go four hours in any direction, and these young men and women are telling me they prefer to be in a warmer weather climate, then why in the world are we taking these kids, and remember, they're kids who are going to flunk tests, who are going to be broken hearted, who are going to have the worst game of their life, let's hope it's not all on the same day, and stick them in a dark, cold dorm room in Syracuse, when their release, when any one of those things happen, are going to be playing around the golf outside, maybe running off to the shore, going on that hike. Something as simple as that type of extracurricular, based on what they like, what they enjoy, they're only going to spend a certain amount of time in a classroom, a certain amount of time if they're lucky enough to play, on a field. Most of their time in four years will be not in a classroom and not on a field. That is when they're going to grow up and go from 17 or 18 year old adolescents to 21 year old men and women in four years that you're paying 150 to 200 to $250,000. We haven't talked about athletics. But I'll tell you what we have done. We found that we were looking for colleges that are less than 7,000 within four hours that have math and science as majors and are going to be in a little bit of a warmer weather climate. And I will warn you of this, mom and dad. The ones that do want to ski and snowboard, there's a couple of them. And they go to that school out in 
Baltimore, Hood College, whatever, they're going to still go ski and snowboard. They're going to ski and snowboard with a bunch of friends you've never met. They're going to get to a car with a bunch of 18-year-olds who have had their license for nine months. And because there aren't any mountains, really, outside of Baltimore, they're going to drive four and a half hours to that ski resort in eastern Pennsylvania with a bunch of strangers you've never met in an environment that they've never been to. And the smart parent's going to get this next part. Surrounded by extracurriculars that they've never seen or been around, especially on a college campus. They're going on that four-hour ride. That could have been, if these kids want to be outside, a ski and a snowboard type of place, they like the colder weather, that could be a 40-minute ride. And they're going with or without you. I don't care if you have GPS track around or something. This is real life, real-world stuff. We've yet to talk about athletics. But fortunately, here we are. Time. 47 minutes into this presentation, we're getting to the part that everybody showed up tonight to hear. For those student athletes, I introduce myself. My name is Mark Lackweaver. I'm a major league baseball blank. What is the job title? What am I? I'm a what? Agent. I have a client roster of roughly 100. Yeah, I represent superstar players. I represent a kid from Stanford, Connecticut, who was drafted by the Yankees in the 37th round, got the minimum of 125000 and, uh, you know, may or may never make it, and only play the next two years of rookie ball in Tampa. I run the gamut. We had the number one overall pick in the draft this year in Anthony Rushman. Highest signing bonus in the history of Major League Baseball. I deal with the best players out there. I know this process pretty well. I'm an agent. And unlike my client roster of 100 or so, every one of these student athletes, congratulations, I'm no longer the only agent in the room. You are all now agents too. You have a client roster of one. Any idea who your client is? It's yourself. If you don't know your client, you don't know how to sell your client, you don't know your pros, your cons, your strengths, your weaknesses, you're going to fail. Because it's your job to go sell yourself to that college coach on that campus that has 7,000 students four hours from here with the majors and the minors we want and the extracurriculars. Because that coach is not full time. They are overworked, they are underpaid, they are understaffed. You are going to have to get on their radar because they're not going to come and get on yours. That's your job as an agent. You have to take this seriously. And this is where we hit a little bit of where we are in society. These students, and it doesn't matter how we got here, but these student athletes cannot communicate one-on-one, -on -one, sitting across from an adult. They cannot look you in the eye and have a conversation for five or 10 or 15 minutes, especially on a topic that they have no interest in covering. Shockingly, you can put their phone or their iPad six inches from their face, and they are locked in more than hurting an assets. They can't take their eyes off that screen. When you put a human being in front of them, they are locked up. Well, when you go to that college and you get in front of that coach, this is going to be your first real, real world, big boy, big girl interview. Your job is to pick up the phone. It's not your athletic director's job. It's not your principal's job. It's not your summer ball coach's job. It's certainly not mom and dad's job. It is the job of the agent, the student athlete, to pick up the phone and call the coach. The good news is you already know where you want to go because you made a list of six or eight or 10 schools that fit what we've spent 50 minutes talking about. You have pre-qualified yourself because when you call that coach and you leave a voicemail and you follow it up with an email, you call the head coach and the assistant coach and the associate head coach and the graduate assistant coach and you call all of them and you email all of them, someone's going to get back to you. Why? Because you're pre-qualified. No different than if I went to that Range Rover dealership and I had outstanding credit and a ton of money in the bank and I told them I wanted to buy a Range Rover, but I'm not sure if it's really going to be a Mercedes or a Beamer, they're going to call me back. I'm qualified to purchase that vehicle. Mom and Dad, 
their academics and ability to get into the school and your financials to pay for it allows them to go to any college they want. And these D2, D3 coaches, they know that. Because the difference between Stonehill and Merrimack, the difference between Middlebury and Amherst, the difference between Oswego and Oneana is this. They are in competition for that student athlete. More importantly, that student. Most importantly, in my opinion, those $150,000 to $250,000. So, that student needs to pick up the phone. Then they have to say, hi, Coach Bowen, this is Mark Lyon. I'm a junior at Yorktown High School in Yorktown, New York, and I'm calling today because I am very interested in Stonehill College. My family and I will be heading up to Stonehill the afternoon of September 18th. We're going to tour the campus at 1 o'clock, and I was just calling to see if you had 10 or 15 minutes before or after practice to sit down with my family and I and talk a little bit about your program and what I thought of the campus. I can tell you that I have a 3.1 GPA, I have a 1080 on my SATs. I am the starting catcher on the varsity baseball team. I play my summer ball for the Shrub Oak Athletic uh, Club American Legion team. And I am very, very interested in Stonehill because I love that it's 10 minutes outside of Boston. It's the right student body size. I'm looking for a school that has about 2,000 students. And again, I just want to put a face with the name and see if you have a couple of minutes. My cell phone number is, my email is, I look forward to hearing from you. Does that sound like a pre-qualified message to a coach? I think so. That student has to leave that message. And when that coach picks up the phone and hears that voicemail from a student who is qualified to get in, who has given them reasons why they really want to come check out that school, who, at least from a back of the baseball card perspective, I gave you some stats. I'm the starting catcher. I hit 310. Whatever. Whatever you want to put into that 45-second voicemail, which inevitably is just going to be typed up, almost word for word, and emailed to the head and the associate and the assistant and the graduate assistant coach. That's the job. That's the job of the agent. Man, someone will get back to you. They might not get back to you right away. You might send it, and it might be crickets for 10 days, and you've got to send it again. Let me ask you. The one sitting to the left of John with the gray hoodie. If that coach gets that voicemail and that email from you, exclusively on everything we've talked about to this point, and they don't return that call or that email in 10 days, are they not getting back to you because they don't like who you are as a player? No. Why? They might have other things going on or different things. But you as a player specifically, what you do on the field, is that why they're not calling you back? You said no, because they haven't seen what? Me play. They haven't seen you play. We haven't gotten to that point in the process yet. So they're not calling you back because, again, they're overworked, they're underpaid, they're understaffed, and oh, by the way, they got their own program to worry about. You're not going to play 22 games like you do out here. You're going to play 40 or 50, and you're going to do it over a 50 or 55-day period. There's a lot happening for that college coach who, by the way, is not full-time, has a family at home, works 18 hours a day, and is not so worried about the 2021 draft class when he's got a season or she's got a season going on right now. So you're going to have to call again. You're going to have to email again. Somebody's going to get back to you. And when they do, they're going to say, hey, I appreciate you reaching out. I got your email. I'd love to sit down, 415, my office after your tour. In the meantime, can you send me a blank, and it's not transcript, what is it? Video. Video. Let me take a look at what you do. Let me see what type of player you are. You already told me what your, what your academics are. That's going to work here. You already told me that you're interested in the communications program, why you want to go to school outside of Boston, how it's the right distance from home. You're pre-qualified because these coaches open up their email inbox, and they don't check it every day. Most of them, if they're not full-time, they're not going to have it on their phone. they got to check at their desk. And they have 119 emails. And 99 of them are from these third-party solicitors that I call track, uh, I call them sharks and tracksuits. These third-party organizations that come out and tell you you've got to give them $2,500, $3,000, $5,000, and they'll find a place for you to play in college. 
Some people sign up for it. Uh, I believe buyer beware. Um, that's just my personal preference because I truly have the belief that every single person in this room can do this on their own. And I'm not going to say that, that that company, that third party company that calls and blows you up and tells you that you need to sign up with them to find a spot, they're going to find a place for you to play. It's in Buffalo with 12,000 students seven hours from you. And you're going to say, well, wait, I don't want to go to Buffalo. That's not where I want to play. They're going to say, well, you hired me to find you a place to play in college. I found that place. You don't want to go there? That's on you. No refunds, my reviewer. So you can do this yourself. You call that coach. You start a dialogue. You send the video. You get that interaction going. And when you're up there on September 19th, after you tour that campus, you saw it for two hours, you've got that four o'clock meeting, you are ready to go. Now one of two things are going to happen when you get into that meeting. One is, you toured the college, you absolutely loved it. You loved the way the campus looked, you loved the buildings, you tasted the food, you snuck into the chemistry lab, whatever. It was all for you, and you can't wait for that meeting. Or, there's no chance I'm going to the school. I have no interest in this meeting. I just want to go home. That's really a real life, real world possibility. I can tell you that going to that coach's office and saying, Coach, I'm Mark, I'm your 4 o'clock. I just want to let you know, we just toured the campus. I'm sure it's an outstanding school for somebody else. It's just, quite honestly, it's probably not going to be the right fit for me. I don't want to waste your valuable time. Uh, I just wanted to say thank you for the opportunity and the willingness to sit down with me. And um, you know, I wish you the best. That coach is going to be so blown away and appreciate that gesture from a 17-year-old kid more than you know. And this sports world, I don't care if you're in the big leagues or if you're in the little leagues, it's this big. And that coach might be across the diamond, might be across the field, because you chose to go to the college that's in their conference. And you're going to see them two or four times a year. You're going to see them eight times over four years. That might be the coach of that premier college summer league team up in, uh, you know, Burlington, Vermont, that you're going to go play for next year. And that relationship was cemented by your professional. But let's play devil's advocate, and let's say this was awesome. The meeting was great. You can't wait till 4 o'clock. You love the campus. You love the tour guide. You're ready to go. You are absolutely applying. Let me run you through what the real life, real world conversation with the coach is going to be. Show me the student athlete hands, because I need to pick out something there. Perfect. No problem. What's your first name? Jessica. So I'm going to be the coach, and I'm going to say, you know, Jessica, I, I, it's great to meet you. I'm glad that, you know, based on what you've said to me so far, I absolutely, positively love to hear that you love the, you love the campus. I watched your video. Thank you for sending that. I definitely think you're a pretty competitive player. Um, but listen, I'm not too worried about how you are on the field, because in all fairness, I know you go to a high school with only 50, you know, 600, 650 students. I can argue, quite frankly, that you wouldn't make the varsity team on any one of these other Ward Melvilles with 3,000 students. So I'm less worried about you on the field as a player. We'll get to that track. What I want to know from you, Jessica, is what kind of person you are, what kind of teammate you'll be. As a freshman, it's going to be really, really hard to start. So when you're at the end of the bench, how are you going to contribute to my team to make it better? Are you the kind of person that's going to show up 15 minutes late or 15 minutes early to my meeting? Are you going to have your cell phone on, or are you going to be texting when we're going through tape, or are you going to be the kind of person that has the phone off in your bag, and it's not even a distraction? When you and the girls go to a party, are you the person that's going to be out till midnight, and everyone's daring each other to jump off the roof into this pool, or are you going to be the kind of person that says, you know what, there's no way anything good's going to come from this, so let's pull back and shut it down, it's time for everyone to go home. Because I need to know who are you. If you are not ready, if you don't think that type of line of questioning is going to come to you in that meeting, in that moment, you are not going to make the team in that 10 or 15 minute correspondence. You're going to have to try out like every other player. That try out when they have 31 kids show up and three spots are open and two are positions you don't play. You're not making the team in that meeting. But if you are not equipped to sit in front of that coach and answer questions like that, you're not going to make the team that day, but you're going to get cut from it like that. Scratch that school off the list. This is not about hoping 
that the next showcase event, that the next camp we get a letter to, is going to result in some white whale unicorn called the Division I Athletic Scholarship. This is real life, real world. And I told you, I don't care if it's the University of Maryland, because you're the best lacrosse player on the island, or if it's Marist, because they're both D1 and the money is equal. Do you want to be five hours away with 35,000 students? Or do you want to be two hours away with 3,500? And all the other things that we've talked about tonight. That's how you recruit yourself. That's how you get in front of a coach. That's how you start a process. That's how you start building a video. That's how this goes. Real life, real world facts. And if you have not heard from that D1 school as an 8th grader or a ninth grader, at the latest as a sophomore, you're not on the D1 radar. I'm sorry, you're not. Because every Division I coach, regardless of gender, regardless of sport, knows who the qualified premier Division I possible players are. I don't care how many events you go to. There's always a needle in a haystack, and a lot can happen between your sophomore and your senior year. But if you're not getting those calls now, and we all know, predominantly on Long Island, who those D1 players are in 8th or ninth grade who are getting those calls, you are not in the same category. That's okay. You're 97 to 99% like I was. And it's going to be really hard to make that team anymore. So, here's mom and dad's part of the presentation. Can you read for me what, do you have a sheet or not? Can you read for me what A says? <coughs> That's okay, I, I understand, I get that. I said 10 grand, there is absolutely, and I'm probably being conservative, $10,000 has been spent over three or four years on all those things that go into this process. I am asking you to take $1,000. You can still have nine grand to go run around and do whatever you're doing. I'm asking you to take a $1,000 investment and put it in to the tutor, to take them from a 2-8 to a 3-2, from a 3-3 to a 3-7 on those SATs, ACTs, from a 1080 to a 1310. Why? Two reasons. The first is, how many of us, we're all sports fans, watch the highest level? These guys, gals, making millions of dollars, making the most bonehead play mistakes. I'll argue that you take that student, make them a better analytical thinker, have their grades jump from that 2-9 to the 3-3, three, three, they are going to be better, faster thinkers on the field. They will be better athletes. That's reason one. Reason two is you have a college decision maker looking at this going, wow, this kid plays two sports, volunteers in the community, and from the time they were a sophomore to the time they graduated, went from a 3-1 to a 3-6, that's got academic scholarship written all over. We're going to give you $7,500 in academic money. It's pretty impressive. You just earn yourself $7,500 in academic money on a $1,000 investment while you're still running around spending the other dollar. Another thing that oftentimes gets overlooked in this is when you guys went on that trip and you guys visited the coach and toured the campus and had that meeting and fell in love with it and couldn't stop talking about it and then actually applied in October or November, you're not going to find out until January or February. In their mind, meaning the students, that's where they're going. And then you find out you didn't get in. Because the 2-9 could have been a 3-1, but we ran off to another event up in, uh, in Albany, opposed to just spending three hours in the SAT prep class every other Saturday for three months on a $1,000 investment. There will be nothing more disheartening in these young men and young women's lives to knock into the school of their choice. They didn't make the cut. I think that could have been controlled. So, that's it. B, can you read for me what B says? Uh, GA academic versus American versus do we have any ninth graders here? Any? You already went. What grade are you at? Uh, 
You're in the back, you're going to participate in the upper grade here. No, it's sophomore. Sophomore, right? So, I'm going to ask you a question. If I'm holding 10 dimes, 10 dimes in this hand right here, it's jingling, right? And I'm holding a $1 bill with George Washington's face on it in this hand. Do the 10 dimes and the $1 bill have the same monetary value if we went to the 7 Eleven and bought a U? Yeah. They do. There was a school and a student who answered that incorrectly. I took it upon myself and said I phrased it before. But they have the same value. The 10 dimes, which are a pain in the butt to carry around, and if I put them in this pocket, somehow there'd only be like seven because I get stuck here or whatever. Nobody wants to carry 10 dimes. Nobody wants to carry the dollar bill. The 10 dimes are an athletic and a merit scholarship. Excuse me. The 10 dimes are an academic and a merit scholarship. The dollar bill, the flash of that, that's the, that's the athletic one that everybody wants. I get the 10 dimes doesn't come with the sweatshirt that you can wear to the stocking shop and boast to your friends and family and neighbors. Central Connecticut State Baseball. I get it. Those sweatshirts come for the academic or the merit scholarship. But the bottom line, the saving the money, plays the same way. And speaking of merit, you want to talk about schools begging to give out dollars and cents to these young men and women, I told you, on the field, in the classroom, in the community, get them involved out there. Special needs. I can't think of an easier organization to get involved with than special needs. Why? Because every one of those special needs students, they have a common denominator. They did not choose to be special needs. They love sports. They have organizations. New York State, unified sports. They have it in this community, and they don't need a $3,000 penny check to get a deduction on your taxes. They need able-bodied volunteers like these young men and women to coach, to be teammates, to be competitors, to be clock operators, whatever. They need those kids to volunteer. And when they do, for three hours, on a Saturday, every other Saturday, for three months, not only will they get some real life, fantastic, real world, how it's going to be when they leave the bubble here, interacting with humanity, you may have just gotten yourself a $5,000 merit scholarship because that college admissions person was just blown away with the selflessness and the involvement in the community. What did I say, 7,500? 7,500 in the academics? It's called five grand in the merit. Got you a $12,500 scholarship. Zero in athletic. And I hear all the time you're going to go to a campus that's four hours from here with 7,000 strangers. And I'll, I'll strongly recommend get involved with special needs. Find one of the poor communities around here. Go volunteer. The ones that are not for profits and they need assistance and they need volunteers to do all the things I just mentioned. I've got parents that have said, well, you know, I really don't want to do that because I don't want them to be uncomfortable. You know, being around special needs kids, being around, you know, underprivileged kids, that can make them feel uncomfortable. Really? You think taking that student and dropping them on a campus with 7,000 strangers by themselves four hours from here is not going to be uncomfortable? Get comfortable with being uncomfortable real fast. Start by doing it right here in your background. Okay, here's the last one. Can you read from you what C is? Okay, so, I promise you, your career, and we're almost done, I promise you, your career is not over if you were to get cut as a freshman on that team. I already told you, 31 people are trying out, there are three spots, one is the position you play. You're going to have to try out like everyone else, it's going to be a six week tryout if you're lucky. And, who knows, maybe you dive for a ball because you're just Johnny Gamer, and you twist your knee, and you're unavailable for the next five weeks. And some kid from Arlington High School in Poughkeepsie comes, plays the same position, works the same position for six weeks, and blows it out of the water. The spot goes to one of them. If you were the kid from Arlington, you would expect to make that team. Then you get caught. Because injuries are a part of the game. Or, coach comes up at the end. For some reason, the roster isn't posted, and he says, listen. I just wanted to let you know, I really think you guys are great and I wish you the best, but I just got an opportunity to be the associate head coach at Boston College. 
I resigned today. They're going to find a new coach, and I wish you all the best. See ya. She's out the door. You're on your own. That's the same one that Jessica was high-fiving with in that meeting 12 months earlier. Yeah, that person doesn't work here anymore. And the new sheriff in town, you might not jive with. That really happens. Or, this one is the most likely. You're a 17 or an 18 year old freshman. You're going to play against 20 and 21 year old men and women. I don't care if you played 8th or ninth grade and varsity because the school's only got 600 students. To be a 17 or an 18 year old freshman and compete against 20 and 21 year old men and women adults will be the greatest athletic jump you will have ever faced. And they are going to be out to embarrass you. There is no way that senior is going to get embarrassed by some freshman. They're going to stick it to you. And you might just take a huge poop down your leg because you are just not that good and not that qualified to be. You're getting cut. Your athletic career is over, right? Hmm. You have two choices. You can knock on the coach's door, or you can walk away. Sadly, today's society blames everyone else, finds zero accountability. It's the coach's fault, I got screwed, everyone else was the problem. And you take your ball and you go home for 11 months. Or, like I said, coach, you got a second? Listen, I'm not here to fight you. I know you cut me for whatever reasons. I'm just telling you that I just want to be a part of this. You want me to set up the cones of practice? You want me to do some administrative work in the office? You want me to be the head of analytics? Whatever. I get I'm not going to be a uniformed player. I just want to be a part of this team. That coach who is not full-time, who is overworked, underpaid, with no full-time assistance, is not going to let some eager beaver freshman just walk away. Come back at 4 o'clock tomorrow. We will find something for you to do. That's real life, real world. And now that student, that freshman, who it's going to be really hard to start as a freshman and see a lot of time anyway, is now part of the team. They have friends by default. Instead of worrying about that four-hour trip to the mountains with all those people you don't know, you now know they have 20 or 25 friends. They're teammates. Those surrogate parents that are lacking because they're just wandering a campus aimlessly, not anymore. They got two or three, four coaches looking out for them. There's still a structure there. So they do that for 11 months. They're around the program. They're still a part of the team. They're sitting next to the coach and learning. They come home the next summer. They still play summer ball. They get bigger and faster and stronger and smarter. They try out again as a sophomore. Who's got the better chance of making the team? The kid that was around for a year, volunteered with the program, and came back and tried out, or the kid that blamed everybody, took off for 11 months, and decided to show up again the following year? Who's got the better chance? A or B? A, not even close. Your career's not over. You have options. So that's kind of how I personally see the recruiting process. Now, I need one student. Um, we're a little short on these, so just do me a favor. Make sure that every student has one, OK? And um, for the students, you know, just kind of do your best to share it. Um, let's get all those around. Okay, so this is what we're going to do. Like I said, we're almost done. I write down what most questions are asked that aren't part of the presentation. I'm going to bang through them real quick. Go measure your town. You don't need to drive all the way to Delaware to go see the D2 or D3. Drive to SUNY Farmingdale and go watch what those athletic programs look like. Because that competitive D3 program here on Long Island is going to look a lot like the same Division III program in Northern Maryland. Measure your talent. Be honest with yourself. Be honest with, did you guys get in the back too? Yes, I Be honest with yourself. Measure your talent. There's nothing wrong with saying, whoa, this is a little more competitive than I think. That's okay. But you need to do that. And you don't have to go that far. You got plenty of great D2, D3 programs right here on Long Island. What a coach might ask, what you should be asking them. I ran you through a couple of examples. Absolutely, positively, take the time, go to the website at the bottom of your page. It's exclusively educational. Anything that I have to tell you is on. This was already paid for by your school district. 
That's the end of the transaction. So the questions on that website, the answers on those websites, those are for you. Be prepared. What you should ask and what they might ask you. I'll just play D2 or D3. I think we covered how hard that is. Do I need a video? You absolutely need a video. What you don't need is a fancy propaganda set to you know, jazzy music and graphics. You need an iPhone to take 15 or 30 or 45 seconds of video of you practicing, of you playing. When you're corresponding with that coach and that coach says, do you have a video? Your response should be, yes, coach, I have a video. What would you like to blank? Let's blank. C. Coach A, Coach B, Coach C from three different schools all might want to see something different. You have an iPhone. It takes video. Give them what they want. Fill the sales void. You're an agent. Give them what they're asking for. Playing in college is a full-time job. You can be the worst D3 player on the worst D3 team. You're going to wake up at 5.30 in the morning. You're going to practice at 5.45. You're going to practice till 8. You're going to go to a class at 8.30. The class is going to end at 10.15. You're going to go to another class at 11. It's going to end at 12.30. You're going to go to another class at 1.30. It's going to end at 3.45. And you're going to be working out and running and doing whatever the kind of secondary part of that season, off-season conditioning is from 4.30 to 6.30. Then you're going to go eat. Then you're going to have to do homework. Then you're going to have to text with your friends and Snapchat and FaceTime and play Fortnite and go to bed. Then you're going to do it again. You're going to do it six days a week for seven weeks, and then you're going to play 40 games in 50 days. It's a full-time job at the worst Division III program in the country. You're a freshman not playing very much. It might not be all that you would dream you were dreaming it to be. That's okay, but you need to know that this is going to be a commitment no different than if you were on a football scholarship at the University of Iowa. Showcases. People think I'm anti-showcases. No. If you go to a showcase and you're paying money, and you ask the showcase administrator what schools are going to be there, and they are like, well, you know, we really can't tell you, I would not waste my money. The good showcases are going to say, here's a list of the 20 schools that are expected to attend. Perfect. We know what we're looking for, 7,004 hours. We know what the product profile is. Of those 20 schools, great, let's do some, let's do some research. We found seven to fit. When your son, your daughter, mom and dad are on the field running around doing everything at their showcase, your eyes are looking for one of those seven schools, two of those seven schools, hopefully all seven of those schools. Because the moment that event's over, it's like a track meet. Those coaches can't get to their cars and get out of there fast enough. You grab your son or daughter, know that the moment that whistle blows and it's over, get back to me because I'm going to show you where the Stonehill coach is. I'm going to show you where the Babson coach is. I'm going to show you where that coach is, and they got to get in front of that coach. Hey, I just wanted to introduce myself. I was number 31. Stonehill's on my list of schools. I just wanted to put a face with the name. I'd love to send you an email. That coach is going to give you a card, and you're going to start this process way sooner and way easier than the one we're describing today. That's how you and the last point that I'll make is, I told you that I would put a little bit of a Division I spin to this. We have as a group found a quality D2, D3 program that fits our criteria of 7,004 hours math, science, and warm -up. That's what we're looking for. And senior year after you have already told and applied and been accepted to that school that fits that profile down in Baltimore, I can't wait to be there. Central Connecticut State, a Division I school outside of Hartford, reaches out and says, we have a decommit, and we're going to offer you a quarter scholarship. Congratulations, you got a D1 scholarship. That's what everybody probably was here to learn about tonight. Central Connecticut State is 36,000 students. It's about 85, maybe 90 miles from here. If you take the ferry, it's much, much closer. It's got 36,000 students, and it's only about two hours away. It's a school geared specifically for education. We're going to use math and science as an example. Those are the majors we're looking for, because we talked about math and science. It's in Hartford. It's a lot colder in Hartford a lot sooner than it does in Baltimore. It stays a lot colder in the spring sooner than it does in Baltimore. Under no circumstances, in my opinion, is Central Connecticut State the right school for our son or daughter to go to.
you got a quarter of a scholarship, they're going to give you $8,500 in Division I athletic money. I just found you $12,500 in academic and merit money. You got more money at a school that's the perfect fit for your son or daughter. Sadly, too many people in this room are going to play at Central Connecticut, a school that is literally 0 for 5 on anything related. Congratulations, you're a Division I scholarship. This is real life, real world stuff. Every single thing I said tonight is not an exaggeration. And when I say it's my opinion, it is my opinion based on two decades of conversations. It's real. What I'm going to close up is the pictures you are holding in your hand that have absolutely nothing to do with anything we spoke about. The reason I gave those pictures to the students, and if there are parents around, I want you to take a glance. For those students, I don't want you to hold back. This is what I say to class participation. I want every single student to shout out how they view that kid. I'm not saying you would say this about that student, but I want you to describe how this student would be described walking down these hallways. Maybe the kid three lockers down. Maybe one of your smart alley teammates. How would this kid be described? Don't say happy. Don't give me what you think like, oh, the lighthearted. Give me the physical description. Go. How would this kid be described? Don't get shy now. You guys have been talking all night. Let's go. How would he be described? Come on, guys. John, let's go, fellas, in the back. You guys start us off. Say it. On athletic. What? Unathletic. Athletic? Okay, what else? Unath I'm saying unathletic. Unathletic. Right, more accurate. What else, though? That kid's walking down the hallway and you go, there's the unathletic kid? There goes what? The what kid? Come on, man. Is he a little overweight? John, is he overweight? I, I mean... You're, you're not going to say there goes the overweight kid. You're going to say what? There goes who? The fat kid finally stepped up and said it. There goes the fat kid. What else is he? Keep coming. What else is he? I'm not saying you're saying it. You hear it three lockers down. What is it? Is he cool? Nerdy. Is he dork? The weird kid. Weird kid? There's the fat, dork, weird, unathletic looking kid who comes walking down this hallway. And that kid hears that every single day in these hallways. Doesn't matter if it's a boy, doesn't matter if it's a girl. That kid gets picked on every moment of his life. In this high school, in every high school, and sadly, down to the middle and even elementary schools today. It's called bullying. And if you don't think it's real, you don't have to watch the third season of 13 Reasons Why to see how it ended. Turn on the news. Read the paper. Bullying is a legit epidemic in every single school in this country. And the bullying, unlike 20, 30 years ago, when you were the bully and you could step up and deal with it face to face, and you could get your friends or teachers or whomever to deal with that type of confrontation, not anymore. Why? It's happening on the phone. Yes. Who said it? Who said that? Because this is where the bully lives now. The bully lives on this phone, on text, on Twitter, on Instagram, on Snapchat, on Facebook. You name it. That bully lives here. This isn't a phone. This is a weapon. This is a weapon. Now let me tell you a little something about this weapon. You think it's funny sending that group text? You think it's funny taking that picture? Well, when you guys decide to take that picture of that girl, that guy, in the locker room, you decide to get on a group text with six or seven others, I don't care if you responded. You get a knock on your door, it ain't going to be from your AD. It's not going to be from your parents. It's going to be from the police. Because you took a picture of a half-naked girl or some guy who got pants, that is child pornography. You're getting arrested, it's going on your record, and your life is all but over. That's real. It happens. There are programs that have completely been disintegrated because of it. You think that a college coach at the D3 level isn't going to vet your social media? They're going to put their livelihood on the line because you decide
decided to quote some rap lyric that had the N-word in it? No chance. You're now a racist. And that ain't going away because there's no erasing social media. I deal with players. We scrub every single player before we even represent them to see how concerning this could be. Us putting our 34-year agency on the line on a kid that's going to be drafted in the seventh round for $340,000. No chance. It happens at college too. If you don't take this seriously, if you don't think that's a weapon, you are sadly mistaken and dangerously putting yourself in jeopardy. Let me tell you a little something about karma, because everybody's in here and they want to play in sports. They want to play in college. Well, you can be the big man or the big girl on campus. You can be the cat's butt. You can be the one in charge. You can be the one, because sadly, somebody has to do the bullying. And unfortunately, because you're student athletes, my opinion is, your job's to be a leader, your job's to step up, protect that kid who's getting made fun of, who's being bullied. Your job's supposed to be a leader on and off the field. To stop that kid three lockers down, to tell your teammate to knock it off. It's not hard to walk down the hall or sit in the cafeteria or invite them out, boy or girl. But sadly, athletes sometimes are the bullies. Well, when you're a freshman, at a school four hours from here with 7,000 strangers on a team with 20 and 21 year old men and women. This is the part of the presentation called karma. Those juniors and seniors, they're going to tease you, they're going to haze you, they're going to bully you. You're going to lay in bed, you're going to cry, you're going to wish you were home, but you're four hours away with no friends with 7,000 strangers. You better think about how you treated people in this community when you wonder why it's happened. And the flip side to the athlete is sometimes the athlete is the one being bullied. I don't care how good of a player you are, how bad of a player you are, sometimes the athlete is being bullied. I can tell you there are two things an athlete cannot penetrate. More importantly, there are two things a bully cannot penetrate. You go up against that opponent that's got courage. You go up against that opponent that's got confidence. That's a tough opponent to beat. You go up against that bully with courage, with confidence, that bully's got no shot. I will tell you that the kid that you are holding in your hand, he's here to him. He's talking to you. The Major League Baseball agent who represents three All-Stars, the guy that lives on the beach in California, the guy that played four years of college baseball and was a captain, yep, he was also the best baseball player in his career. I heard it all. But I had courage. I had confidence. I am living proof that you can fight through it. You find that one thing that you can latch on to. Because every one of us, we do something special. We all have something inside us that's a bit of a gift. Figure it out. Grab onto it. Harness it. Develop it. Use it. Because that's going to get you through that bully. That bully can't touch you if you're able to use it. You have to. Have to take this bullying situation seriously. You do not have to become what the bully says you are. Who the bully says you are. You have to be who you know you are and what you want to be. And the last thing I will say on this topic, if I leave you with any point tonight, is... Take it seriously. Every single person in this room, parents included, trust me, so much goes on under your nose, under your roof. You have to, have to ensure you are not part of the problem, but rather, collectively, every single one of you, you're part of the solution. I really appreciate being here tonight. I will stay up front until the last question is answered. I appreciate your patience. I know it was a long evening, but thanks so much for having me.
10 special meetings. Okay, that's a good sign. 
you know, and unfortunately, look, I deal with it on Twitter with the trolls, and you, I get to represent, you know, a player that goes, you know, four for four, and a hundred uh, comments will be made after a game. There'll be one that was not positive, 99 were glowing, and that player focuses on the one. I don't think it's any different in these situations. We focus on the schools that, you know, didn't show us attention and we're ignoring, especially the D2, D3 beneath us schools. I, I hope that tonight we all understand how challenging that will be. So I hope that helps. Any other questions? Yes, go ahead. Uh, this is where I thought your question was going. She asked if it was if, if there's, I guess, an advantage to have a bigger game club, does it really matter if sports, soccer, field hockey, lacrosse, baseball? But talent plays. Talent plays. You know, last year I went to Chance Adams' major league debut in, in Boston. Shane Robinson played right field for the Yankees that day. He just played a ball in the first inning. Chance gave up two runs. Pitcher well enough in Boston's big league debut. Two weeks later, Aaron Judge came back. Shane Robinson was released from the team, and Aaron Judge played right field ever since. Talent plays. Plays in the big leagues, and plays at the lower level. If you are talented enough, if you are good enough, I don't care if you are playing for a tiny high school or if you're playing for the most premier soccer program out there, you're good enough to play at the next level if you're good enough to play at the next level. You putting yourself on a radar, I don't think it matters where you play. The Division Three coach at Middlebury, the Division Two coach at Stonehill, the Division III coach at the University of Scranton is not rude and odd about some travel ball team in Central Long Island that they've never heard of that is the best in this community. They care about that video you sent them and are you really that good? Can you compete at this level? On that 20-person soccer team, three of those players were a girl, men or women. They're studs. 17 other people made the team. The difference in talent between the other 17 is this big. Maybe somebody is the best practice player. Maybe somebody is that much more mature, and when the coach is running 15 minutes stuck in traffic, can text that player and say, get everybody on the field and start stretching because I'm going to be late. People make teams for a lot of different reasons. Think of your own high school teams. You never know. So talent is one component of it. But I would not get too caught up with, you know, keeping up with the Joneses with one program or the other. Just my opinion. One thing I will say, and I'll grab your question, is. Don't look at your athletic director as the enemy. Don't look at your guidance counselor as the enemy. These people work and choose to live in this environment for you and your families at the betterment of your son and daughter, mom and dad. If they choose to give you how they see it, and an honest opinion, and it's one that you don't want to hear, don't be the person that's like, what's the ax to grind? Why aren't you helping my kid? You're clearly playing favorites. This is what they do for a living and they're really qualified. Use them as resources, because picking up the phone and either calling the Stetsons, or calling the Stonehills, or calling the Scrams is going to be the best endorsement call you will ever get. They're on your team. Yes? So just my other really brother's question, I'm sure you think I was the first time, I'm sure you just go by the numbers. How do you get the set something that the first time, do you think how that goes to that? I mean, to answer the question, I don't know, like, honestly, I'm not an expert right on it, but this is what I would encourage you to do. We really focused a, a long time on one through four. That part's pretty easy, right? If you were just, like, off the charts, like, you know, just, you know, the fastest person ever, um, or whatever is involved, right? You're Hussein Bolt. They're going to know who you are and how to find you, okay? But at the same time, Mr. T is going to be a lot more qualified. His resources are going to be a lot greater, including your coaches, right? As a group, they're going to be able to truly help you. That's such a unique individual sport that it's not so much an exception to the rule, but maybe it just has an extra layer, right, of having to fight through it. But when you get the first four parts out of the way, Ask them. Ask them to assist in this process. I know you still have to make that call and get on the radar, but they can at least help narrow that process to ensure that you get the attention from the coach, you get the fair shake of sending the videos or whatever it is to engage in potentially being in a collegiate athlete. I don't know if that answers the question. The answer is yes. Okay. Yeah. They're gonna look they're gonna look at your times for right. that part of that school. They're gonna look at times when they, the contact is important and you do. Said, um, I have contacted many, many, many colleges, many athletic directors in colleges, many coaches in colleges for individual people who come to me and ask me to. Um, so 
So, so, and it is very, very effective to get a call from me as a coach in a college and say, you know, I have this kid. But it doesn't work if the kid hasn't had contact with the coach. That is important. I'm the follow-up, usually. Um, so if, if anybody in this room or otherwise um, has a list, has a couple colleges, they want you know, that process to go through for me. I'm more than willing, and I've done it many times successfully, got coaches to, you know, because a lot of times when you have your coach, or your private coach, or your trainer, they are a vested interest. And quite honestly, the college coaches don't always necessarily believe them. When they hear from me, you know, they, they tend to, to believe more. So that is open to anybody at any point. Uh, always has been. It's absolutely true. Character matters. Character matters. We represent players. We turn down guys in the big leagues. We turned down one guy in particular on Pittsburgh. who was an all-star a year ago. And he his character is far too risky. It's not the guy that got caught with a 13-year-old girl. But how about that? Do you think the Pirates knew that this guy was in that position? He was the number one trade piece for any team in postseason contention on July 31st. He was at the time the best closer in here. Character matters. So when he's on the phone, your guidance folks are on the phone. And yeah, we can talk about times all day long. What kind of person are they? What are they going to bring to the table? Why would I want to babysit this kid for certainly their freshman year, arguably for the first few years of their college experience? And I'm sorry, these adolescents, they're different. They, they, I think they just need a little more interaction with coaches and, and quite frankly, a little more coddling, which is even more of a commitment to a coach that's got a family and enough going on. Character matters, that endorsement call could be far more important than the difference between a sector or two between you and the other player. Any other questions? All right, I'm happy to see you around if you have a couple one-on-ones.